We'll now begin. Justin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I also would like to say good morning or good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending on where you're at in the world. You know, uh, I'm, I'm very excited the fact that uh, we had quite a bit of uh, interest and, and uh, worldwide participation with our first webinar. Um, I'm presenting a topic today that's not, that's not complex, uh, but, but I personally believe it's, it's extremely valuable. Uh, so since we got all the necessary uh, introductions done, uh, let's go ahead and, and begin our discussion on bridging the gap. As always, uh, uh, we cannot uh, begin without a short and sweet reminder from our legal department uh, regarding our copyrights. In the mining industry, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have been a, a part of both the open pit operations and the maintenance environments. Uh, being a mechanical engineer, I, I was able to settle into my final destination in maintenance, uh, but I always was amazed with the amount of raw data that was coming from these different uh, systems. You know, looking at the technologies for our fleet management systems, material management, uh, blasting designs, onboard equipment sensors, uh, different third-party technologies. The list just really goes on and on uh, of what we have available to us. Uh, we have so many data points and, and the data continues to increase uh, that several professionals in, in the market realize that it, you know, it's time for, for our groups in operations, maintenance, reliability to get back to focusing on, on collaboration. Uh, bring this information together for the good of the equipment, the good of the mine, and the good of our companies. Ken Kelton described a, a typica, typical maintenance cycle uh, in a white paper written in 2010 uh, talking about unscheduled breakdowns and, and pretty much uh, how we drop everything to, to fight the fires. Uh, it really hit home to me when I, when I was reading, uh, quote, when the problem is fixed, calm returns until next time, unquote. Firefighting, triage, priority management, however you want to look at it, uh, when we've been, you know, we've been doing things in, in maintenance in a similar fashion all around the world and, and uh, whether we don't have the necessary data or the, or the resources or, or the commitment from the organization to stop that next time, I, I believe we should, you know, bring our focus on changing that culture. Uh, we don't want that next time to, to really surprise us. Uh, you know, if you don't happen to uh, be reading the Uptime Magazine, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's great for researching and, and understanding what's happening in maintenance and, and the reliability world. Um, I've kept my copy from uh, April 2010 uh, because of a great article written by Paul Castro. Um, you know, have you seen changes in, in, in the mind since the economic crisis? Have you seen, you know, uh, things that are, that are asking for cost-cutting initiatives to, to begin? Well, Mr. Castro, he, he proposes that, that we manage those risks through collaboration and creating this reliability-centered operations. Uh, it, it's kind of hard for me to imagine a reliability-centered operations. I would guess that in, in most of our situations, we, we want to manage our risks. We want to try to, to maximize profit and, and by getting a few more hours out of an engine or, or push the, the oil change a little further to, to go beyond uh, the recommended oil change. Um, you know, we'll spend some time on, on investigating how, how we can build those relationships, share information, and speak in terms that our operational coworkers uh, will appreciate and, and recognize our priority or our projects as, as a priority. Um, I think this can assist you in, in turning your maintenance reliability into reliability-centered operations. Uh, I promise, uh, guys uh, and ladies, uh, that this is this is my last quote of the day. Um, but when a when a company is large and, and as successful as Caterpillar speaks, uh, I, I think it's wise to to listen. Um, as I was reading Dave's words in in an article in in Mining Magazine, he was speaking about uh, the need to have collaboration between the manufacturer and the distributor and the end user, having all this available data and instructions. Um, I instantly began to, to think about what we could learn from Caterpillar. Uh, I see it as a great example uh, of what we're also trying to do. Um, I replace manufacturer with maintenance, uh, distributor with reliability, and, and the end user with operations. Uh, we can take from this example that, that we should not be afraid to go out there and benchmark uh, other organizations. 
our goal as reliability professionals is, is to change how maintenance is performed and, and to achieve capacity assurance. Uh, we don't really need to reinvent the wheel just to uh, move in this direction. <clears throat> uh, I'm proposing that at, at some point in this, in this uh, presentation, you're, you're going to hear some, some pretty common phases um, like uh, paradigm shift. Uh, do, do we wonder why these common phrases uh, continue to show up at conferences or, or in written articles? Um, I'd say that, that they remain in the conversation because we, we really haven't been successful in shifting our organization, organizational silos. Um, we, we're not really a unified group focusing on, on maximizing production. Instead, our, our focus is typically narrow on, on what, we can adju uh, what we can achieve to, to accomplish our, our group's goals. Uh, and those goals are, are typically you know, designed uh, with the desire of helping the organization. Um, the other shift that, that uh, we need to do is, is not accepting the status quo. Uh, do we really need to, to plan for a certain percentage of unscheduled down equipment? Should we accept this as, as the way that things uh, are and, and we need to have a buffer in our maintenance and in our operational plans to account for this? Or should we, should we challenge each stoppage, identify the root cause, uh, work towards eliminating this distraction in our plan? Uh, take some chances. Try to see your project from another perspective. Uh, see if you're jumping from that little bowl into the big bowl, or maybe you're jumping from the big bowl back to the little. Really, when we, when we look at our uh, available data sets, we typically see in, in maintenance that we have things such as uh, machine health alarms uh, indicating that, that uh, turbo is going bad or, or some other thing. Machine onboard sensors giving us real-time analog data on temperatures, pressures. Uh, then we can, we can also receive data loggers from the OEM to, to uh, record specific amount of information. We also receive these OEM troubleshooting guides and recommendations that, that we should adhere to. And we have uh, things such as our, our uh, ERP systems giving us a, a vast amount of, of historical information on, on components and, and what kind of work we've done. Uh, over in operations, uh, we have, we have uh, things such as, as machine status information. Uh, it, it keeps track of, of who's been operating, what they've been operating, uh, what kind of material they're moving, uh, keeping track of, of payload, uh, and even our location with GPS. You know, this data is, this data is there. It's, it's intended to assist us in, in facilitating or, or optimizing our, our functioning organizational systems. Uh, we're really going to focus today on, on two uh, of our organizational systems, operations and, and maintenance. Uh, we all understand uh, for operations to be, to be successful, uh, they must maintain a system of, of moving material. Material is, is what makes us uh, money. So they have their system of, of loading, hauling, spotting, dumping, and, and so on and so on. And they, and they need to stay in, in that system. Uh, for maintenance uh, to be successful, their, their system should you know, look similar to scheduling maintenance, sending it out for operation, doing some fuel and lube, doing condition-based monitoring, all the while trying to get back to, to our scheduled maintenance. Each time we, we fall out of these uh, ideal systems, we, we introduce inefficiencies to our organizational system. Overloading a truck requires action from operations, or even a, a plugged air filter requires action from, from maintenance, taking us you know, out of that ideal flow. Um, I, I challenge each and every one of us that, that's on this call uh, to, to kind of focus on, on a collaborative system. What does it look like when we uh, incorporate both the operational and the maintenance system together? Shouldn't our system be, you know, uh, uh, to schedule maintenance then, then to operate? And, and in the time that it takes us to get to our next scheduled maintenance, we, we should be servicing and using condition-based monitoring to identify potential failures. All the while, uh, you know, maximizing the time that, that each piece of equipment uh, remains in this large cycle. If we identify this system as, as our, our goal to achieve, continue or, or, or uh, use this uh, to identify our reliability projects, 
they'll be focused on, on not necessarily only reducing maintenance costs, but they'll also be focused on increasing tonnage, uh, getting us a, a little bit closer to that concept of, of reliability-centered operations. Um, I, I warned you, you know, at the, at the beginning of this, uh, this webinar that uh, this, this idea, this concept, it wasn't going to be complex, you know. Uh, I, I'm hoping that, that as we're talking and, um, and as the questions come in and, and as I'm presenting, that you gain maybe another perspective and, and garner a little bit of, of newfound energy uh, to begin these discussions back with, with your organizations. You know, each, each breakdown that we have, it, it disrupts our organizational system. Uh, it costs us in, in production and increased maintenance costs as we rush to make those repairs. Truck interruptions in our system, you know, that disturbs our, our whole road network. Um, excavator interruptions create idle time and, and reroute uh, haulage equipment. Loader interruptions can hurt stockpile deliveries or, or even other critical material movement uh, functions. All these, all these potential interruptions to, to our larger organizational system um, results in operational losses, inefficiency, production losses. Uh, then we get the maintenance cost associated with redirecting resources, locating the, the quick part for replacement or, or repair procedures. Uh, and potentially delaying the, the release of, of other equipment scheduled to be worked on. Uh, if, if you're wondering, you know, at the end of this webinar, I promise there's no test. Uh, but but uh, if I was to give a test, every question in that test could be answered with uh, two words, capacity assurance. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan of, of this term. Uh, I believe there's uh, really a, a systematic approach that we can take to identifying our reliability projects uh, that, that can help us move towards capacity assurance uh, while we also take into account uh, the needs of the business. Um, I could be, you know, this idealist and, and say that uh, we, all, we all can solve capacity assurance immediately. You know, if we, if we were in this ideal world where our criteria was to to have an engine last for three years, you know, our, our solution would be just, just don't use that engine in a mine. You know, if, it, if you're not going to put it to work, uh, you're just going to let it sit there idle, change some oil, hey, we achieved capacity assurance. Uh, I, I'm not going to be that idealist. I, I, I'm going to be more of the realist and, and identify that, that we really can't uh, move forward. We can't create these projects without some means of making good business decisions while, while also providing uh, organizational improvements. Um, as we focus uh, on this target, um, I've identified four levels to help us reach our goal. First, uh, we have the outer ring uh, where we need to be performing our, our root operational root cause analysis. Uh, the inputs we have for this RCA includes our fleet management status events, the GPS location, the operator information, payload and material type, all those things that, that we identified as, as available uh, data points. Uh, we're trying to really identify for every unscheduled down event why it occurred. Uh, a quick and easy proven way or, or method of, of doing this is to ask five whys. Uh, basically, when you're uh, uh, looking at a problem, get your first answer. Don't settle on your first answer. Dig in deep analyze all aspects, and try to take your first answer uh, through five levels of, of analysis. The next two levels um, take our time and, uh, and our focus. Uh, if you've been involved in, in performing a, a failure modes effects analysis, you understand why this takes so much time and, and so much focus. When performing a system FMEA, uh, we should have persons brainstorming all these, all these different potential failure modes. So when, uh, whether you're performing this uh, failure modes effects analysis on, on a system like an engine or even going to the next level of, of FMEA on the subsystems like the turbochargers, the process is, is established, it's, it's got results, it, it improves your maintenance and, and monitoring process. Um, really through, through this FMEA, uh, the process identifies your failure modes, your effects, and your causes. Uh, from, from those, we, we have to 
you know, take the, the information and identify the severity of those failure modes, the frequency, um, and how easily we can detect them. Uh, the inputs that, that are important for us to ensure that, uh, that, that we use during the FMEA process are things like our, our OEM documentation, uh, bringing in our local uh, maintenance knowledge or uh, uh, contractor expert uh, knowledge, experienced operator knowledge, and even the reliability center maintenance techs. You know, those guys uh, and girls uh, are excellent resources to, to providing insight on, on such things as, as oil analysis results. Uh, the final level in our, in our target is, is how we consolidate this information um, from all the other levels of our analysis. Taking everything we've done with the operational and system research, placing it into this, you know, this analytical blender and, and hoping that, that the cream of opportunities uh, rise to the top. Um, our goal in this analysis uh, is to identify with each unscheduled down event uh, what is the root cause of it? From that root cause, uh, we associate with uh, what system and, and what systems, uh, subsystems uh, were identified in that root cause analysis. Instead of just uh, performing a parade analysis on, on what is our most frequent downs, uh, we can now determine which system is our largest contributor to that downtime. Here, uh, we could start researching the health indicators uh, from our collected sensors and alarms, uh, reviewing our, our failure modes effects analysis, or even uh, take our analysis down, you know, an, another level. From that system that's uh, causing all the, all the headache and downtime, do a Pareto on, on what subsystem uh, is our top contributor to that system of downtime. Uh, the focus directs us to, to the issue that's creating this, this larger loss of, of production. Uh, and the, the reason this analysis is a little uh, different is it actually allows for, for nuisance I items to potentially uh, be identified as, as a huge issue. Um, say if, if you have frequent stops in your fleet uh, for broken mirrors. Um, this is, you know, we identify this as, as a cheap replacement for, for uh, most of us. Um, but what if that, that frequent downtime adds up to substantial production loss. Uh, those cheap replacements uh, are not necessarily cheap anymore. Uh, there's hidden losses that, that we uh, ignore when we're just looking at reducing maintenance costs uh, by attacking only you know, things like large engine failures. <clears throat> uh, we're going we're gonna to stick with, with uh, the KISS principle. Uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't heard this principle before, you know, it's, it's a good reminder to all of us that, that try to think too hard. Um, KISS stands for keep it simple, stupid. Um, I have to remind myself of, of this quite frequently, uh, you know, since I'm one of those engineers that, that typically tries to, to overthink situations and, and try to go uh, a little more in depth. Um, so we're basically going to make this, this process uh, very straightforward and, and hope that uh, you can try this philosophy out. First, you know, I, I recommend that you, you start by reviewing your status codes. Make sure you have enough detail in your tracking for your site. Doesn't necessarily require that you have, you know, a hundred codes since we are focused on, on the root cause analysis of, of the event, not the, not the code. Second, uh, you have to have a method to associate your system and subsystem uh, failure modes effects analysis to that status event. Um, identifying, saying that when this uh, unscheduled down, uh, we're going to tag it with uh, this system, this subsystem. And then lastly, uh, definitely not least, uh, we need to be, begin performing our root cause analysis. Um, associating the system and subsystem uh, documentation to each uh, unscheduled down. Build this repository of, of information um, allowing us to identify our organizational system weak links. Uh, these are the, the areas that, that are breaking our, our cycle of capacity assurance that, that we're working so hard to, to achieve. 
you know, use those uh, system and subsystem links uh, between your, your operational RCA uh, and machine health data uh, to collaborate what is causing your lost production. Now, you know, now that we've really spent all this time and energy and, and focus on identifying our areas of concern, uh, we know what systems and subsystems are, are causing um, our lost production. We know the failure modes. We know the effects. We know the causes. Uh, we have the systems and subsystems with the, with, with the uh, associated information. We, uh, we've, we've identified any kind of indicators in our FMEA uh, that could potentially help us detect uh, the failures. Uh, so now it's time to, to do the next level, uh, to do some condition-based monitoring, uh, to develop those statements and, uh, for our specific failure modes. Um, identify, monitor, predict, and take action. This fits really into our, into our goal of, of taking our sources of data, uh, performing our FMEA or our RCA, and, and turning it into information. Uh, then we, you know, we're creating our predictive models and implementing actions uh, to reduce our production losses. Data to information to action. You know, through, through collaboration, both, both through breaking down these organizational system silos and, and using additional data sources available to you, uh, you'll be able to find your areas of concern. You'll be able to identify projects that, that operations and maintenance agree upon on priority. Um, and I, I personally believe you'll, you'll find success in your reliability projects. Uh, you know, I, I may have gone a little quick, hopefully not too fast, uh, but I, I really appreciate all of you, you know, spending some time with me uh, listening to this webinar. Uh, right now I'll, I'll turn the webinar back over to Andrew and, and we'll begin with some questions. Uh, sure, Justin. We did have a few questions that came in um, from the attendees. First question, does this require technology to implement? Uh, there's kind of two ways that I would, I would answer that. The first one would be you do need some form of technology because you need uh, those operational and maintenance data points. So uh, whether it's, it's having some OEM sensors, uh, alarms, um, some form of technology there to gather that information. Um, it could be a, as simple as, uh, as you know, going up to a piece of equipment and, and plugging a laptop in and, and doing some, some manual downloads. But there is some form of technology there. After you have that data, um, technology can be a enabler, but not, uh, it's, it's, it'll help you streamline the process, but it's not necessarily a, a key factor. After you get the data, it's how much time and effort you want to spend in manipulating the data uh, without a technology. So I would say, you do need some onboard technologies, but depending on what you want to do and how quickly you want to get to your results uh, will determine what technology you need after that. <clears throat> Question just came in. Uh, can you give me a specific real-life example of, of data to information to action? Oh, uh, you know, uh, I, was, I was really hoping to uh, you know, I, I would say um, I'll answer this question, um, and we, we have some, some case studies. Um, I was going to try to stay away from, from focusing on, on what Modular has, has done in the past, but we do have examples of, of uh, uh, customers actually doing uh, in, in real time, taking some, some raw data, turning it in for, into information, and, and putting it into action. Uh, we actually have a case study uh, on our website um, uh, related to a, a mine in, in uh, Chile. Uh, they focused specifically on, the, on that large headache, that, that large engine, and put into place a predictive model that could uh, warn them um, early enough that, that they could put it into their two-week scheduling uh, 
uh, plan. They didn't want it warning them uh, a day in advance prior to failure. They, they wanted to build their condition-based statement off of a two-week scheduling uh, plan. So, so they did take uh, the raw data that they had on board, converted it into information by building up this condition-based uh, monitoring statement from their failure modes effects analysis, identifying how early um, or what specs that they need to, to detect in order to have a two-week uh, heads up, and then they put it into action by putting it into their scheduled maintenance plan, keeping on that, and actually improving their availability by 4% just from that one uh, uh, process. Great question. Uh, another question came in the field. Um, do you have FMEAs already developed for specific pieces of equipment that could be customized? Uh, you know, I, I think this question, um, I, I would probably like to pass that on to our uh, value-added services group. We, we have a consulting group uh, that, that can come out and, and work with, with uh, an organization on uh, performing specific FMEAs and doing value stream maps and, and all that. Um, here in, in my role, no, I do not have uh, specific FMEAs already developed. Um, it's, it's, it's a reliability process. Um, there's templates out there on, on the Internet that are, that are free and, and very useful just to, to help you streamline the process. Um, I think there's, there's some free ones in, in Excel as well that, that just basically give you um, a structure of, of identifying all your potential failure modes. Um, allowing you to put some severity and, and frequency and, uh, and all that, and, and it'll help you do your calculations to, to identify, um, you know, your largest risks. So, uh, no, I don't, we don't have uh, FMEAs already developed for specific pieces of equipment, uh, but we're, we're more than willing to, to come help and, and assist in doing the FMEAs, and if, if you would like, I can even uh, send you um, you know, a uh, uh, free uh, template that, that I've used in the past. Uh, one additional question that came in, is there a way to quantify what is identified as the system that is creating the most downtime as the largest gain, or is it possible that the second or third most common system has the largest gain for organizations? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I'll go back to, to my uh, my example that I, that I was talking about during the presentation, I, I threw out mirrors out there. Um, uh, I, I did that to, to basically, you know, go to the extreme. Um, I don't personally believe that, that mirrors will come up as your top priority. It, it may be fairly large in, in downtime, but I would say most organizations try to, to adjust those and, and fix those during shift change so that they don't interrupt. Um, so yes, I would say that if you, if you identify um, you know, what are your top systems creating downtime, you then need to, to basically associate uh, maintenance cost and production losses to identify which one is, is that cream of the crop. Um, if, it's, if it's a high production loss and there's something that's right behind it that's just slightly less of a production loss, but it costs a lot more for maintenance to repair, then definitely uh, the number two or number three uh, system could be the project you need to focus on. Um, that should just about wrap up the major questions we have. Obviously, we'll be following up with many uh, of you on uh, some of those questions directly as we discussed. I really uh, appreciate that uh, your attendance today. We hope you found it informative. This was our first webinar of this kind, so we greatly appreciate your feedback and a survey that should appear on your screens after the webinar is ended. Additionally, a copy of this webinar will be available to you, and we'll send it out to via email in about a week. Thanks, and we greatly appreciate your time today. Thank you. Please stand by.